morning and welcome back to the lecture series on partition of India in print media and cinema. So, we are uh, going to continue our discussion on caste politics in Bengal chapter. Uh, so, we were talking about Jinnah's emphasis on uh, a single language that is Urdu which pointed to a single and almost a totalitarian frame of a nation and a nationhood uh, which, which did not uh, uh, take uh, which, which did not acknowledge uh, other ways of life uh, such as uh, asserted uh, by the Bengali Muslims. So, which did not uh, take into consideration uh, other ways of existence uh, or, or other languages, other ethnicities as, uh, as, as uh, uh, asserted or, or, or as lived by the uh, Bengali Muslims. So, Urdu claimed uh, for national language monopoly and uh, forcefully defined a single frame of nation through the idea of one language. So, uh, and then uh, the, the very idea of Bengali Muslims not being patriotic or authentic uh, keeps uh, coming uh, back uh, both in the discourse of the elite, uh, 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 elite Muslims as well as uh, elite uh, Hindus. Uh, so, uh, uh, we understand I, I have already spoken about hi, how the uh, how the idea of Pakistan uh, or the idea of uh, uh, Muslim uh, being a Muslim did not mean the same for uh, the natives uh, and the ones that had to migrate uh, one's uh, location one's um, position in the new uh, polity would uh, greatly define or greatly inform one's uh, a sense of belonging as well as one's uh, info, uh, one's, one's Muslimness. So, uh, Pakistan's uh, military leadership was culturally and inherently West Pakistani and they would not uh, perceive that uh, the desire to be Bengali, I mean uh, West Pakistani uh, popular uh, notion was that being Bengali and wanting to trade with India. Uh, was not inherently compatible with the one's desire to be Muslim and independent of India. The two could not uh, go hand in hand being Bengali trading with India and also being a good Muslim and uh, independent of India. So, uh, the movement of an is, uh, independent Bangladesh was marked by uh, uh, charges of uh, economic uh, uh, and cultural exploitation of East Pakistan by West Pakistan during the 1950s and 1960s. Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, which, who was the leader of uh, Pakistan People's Party, uh, had uh, 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 Pakistan People's Party that had swept the polls in West Pakistan, had his uh, political discourse anchored in socialism, uh, decentralization and restoration of democracy. So, uh, Bhutto actually blamed the overarching centralization and cold blooded exploitation of people saying that the tragedy of Pakistan lies in the fact that it has been a federation in name only. The spirit of federalism and the rules of coexistence were sacrificed at the altar of ambition. In the name of strong centers, the power of provinces were weakened to the point of being extinguished. So, uh, between 1950 and 1958, five different uh, constitutional proposals emerge. Uh, one of uh, these proposals actually uh, gave uh, equal representation to East Pakistan in the national in the in the national legislature, in spite of the fact that the province had a majority of uh, the population of uh, Pakistan. So. Uh, 1962 constitution of Ayub Khan maintained the principle of parity between the two wings and give uh, Paki, and give East Pakistan 50 percent of the total seats in the national legislature. So, uh, denial of uh, this opportunity to form a government despite uh, the Awami League winning majority number of seats was uh, uh, seen as the beginning uh, of the end of United Pakistan. So, uh, so uh, one sees that the road to a separation begins with the, uh, the, the road to a separation of the two wings begin uh, with the uh, uh, postponement of uh, the session of uh, assembly which was scheduled to be held on 3rd of March 1971. 
So, uh, in, in uh, place of this assembly what happens on 25th March 1971 is a military crackdown on uh, Eastern Pakistan with the acquiescence of Lieutenant General Yaqub Ali Khan uh, who was the commanding officer of the Eastern Command. So, and uh, with uh, the governor, with the governor's uh, support, uh, the governor at, at that time was with the support of Governor um, Admiral Asan. So, uh, talking about uh, the the major difference in handling Punjab and Bengal partition, one realizes uh, that uh, during uh, I, I one realizes that uh, in the case of Punjab, uh, I mean. Generally speaking, there was a mutual agreement of virtual exchange of population, uh, where the centre took uh, measure. Uh, whereas in the case of Bengal, so in the case of uh, uh, Punjab, there was uh, a mutual agreement of virtual exchange of population. Whereas in the case of Bengal, the centre took uh, measure to limit the transfer of population, as the violence was uh, understood as not as extreme. Vi the violence in, in in the case of Bengal was uh, understood. Uh, being not as extreme as in the case of Punjab. Uh, in this uh, context, uh, Anushwa Basu Rechaudhuri notes that the migration of his Bengalis from East Pakistan to West Bengal happened in phases, they can be uh, studied as, uh, uh, they can be largely divided as three major phases and three uh, and they were actually, uh, the people were driven by three basic imperatives, dhan or property. Uh, uh, man or, or uh, prestige and pran or life. So, so the old mi migrants were those that entered uh, West Bengal between October 1946 and uh, 1958. They were uh, eligible for minimum uh, government support and they were mainly from the upper caste and the elite sections who were hardly seen as imposing any economic burden on the government. So, Although their property, uh, all their properties were not movable, they were, uh, they, they could sell or exchange them. So, rehabilitation was more systematically done in their case. They had, influ they had influential relatives in more, most cases, uh, they had in influential relatives in the metropolises or uh, the smaller towns of what, uh, what uh, carved out as West Bengal. Now, the in between migrants were the uh, service class people, they, the government identified this group as economic rather than political migrants and so government did not recognize them as displaced persons and did not in, in most cases did not uh, give any financial benefits. So, in fact by 1958 the central government was urging West Bengal to wind up its rehabilitation uh, ministry. Uh, so, the in between migrants comprised the uh, service oriented middle class uh, who were uh, not always moneyed and yet they had their proper proper social networking and uh, they had uh, the benefits of education. So, they could uh, find uh, find uh, some jobs for themselves through uh, using their uh, uh, cultural capital uh, and uh, these uh, this, this populace the in between migrants uh, have been uh, perceived as greatly adding to the population of West Bengal in addition to uh, the population of Tripura and Assam. So, uh, many of them due to their class caste pride would refrain from uh, seeking government help. Finally, the new migrants were comprised the lowest caste of Bengals, the Dalits, the uh, I mean which uh, had the groups such as the Dalits uh, comprising the Namasudras, the Sadgops, the Pondras and uh, they were actually leaving Bengal uh, to, to save their pran. So, uh, with uh, like I have said with the initiation of the passport system in April 1952, the borders of the adjacent nation states had uh, tightened and taken deeper religious meanings and so uh, deeper religious tones and so the, the, the minorities on each side would feel uh, for would actually uh, uh, have. So, the passport system actually rendered a further marginalized status to the existing minority in East Pakistan. So, uh, so, like I said uh, the uh, with the uh, initiation of passport, the religious uh, tones actually deepened, uh, the, the borders tightened and uh, the passport actually rendered a further marginalized 
status uh, to the minorities. So, uh, the new migrants were losing their ancestral jobs, uh, they would I mean the, the, the Muslim grassroots people would be preferred for uh, the, the jobs that they were traditionally doing. So, they had to move to West Bengal without any secure alternate vocation. Uh, and and uh, there were three modes of settlement also, the rehabilitation made by government, exchange of properties between Hindus and Muslims and purchase of lands by the immigrants without any government support. And so, we see that the Bengali immigrants actually trickle in at various periods against different historical backdrops uh, in the immediate decades after the partition. So, direct action day uh, in August 1946. And uh, after the Muslims had uh, enforced the true nation concept uh, in 1948, uh, uh, after the annexation of the Muslim, uh, Muslim princely states of, uh, so, so in 1948 after the annexation of the Muslim princely state of Hyderabad and then in 1949, 1950 with the anti-Hindu uh, riots in uh, Khulna and Barisal, uh, mid 1950s with the national language issue and adaptation of the Islamic constitution and uh, in 1964 there was a mass exodus after the theft of the holy hair from the Hazrat Bal mosque in Kashmir. Uh, finally, we see that uh, there is uh, 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 um, there are a number of uh, refugees actually, a uh, horde of refugees uh, uh, coming to, to uh, West Bengal to India during the war of liberation and formation of Bangladesh in uh, 1971. So, uh, Ashish Nundi notes uh, that uh, Sohrawardi uh, actually did not uh, want bloodbath, uh, yet his constituency actually comprised immigrant laborers and they would be uh, agitated, uh, uh, it was volatile and uncontrollable group largely and they would be uh, uh, agitated and hijacked for violent causes. So, upper class influential people uh, would not risk their own lives, but they were ready to risk the lives of these proletarians and these uh, slum dwellers uh, who could be very easily hired as bastions of fanatic leaders. So, uh, Profunda Rachudri talks about how the post partition uh, uh, new generation in West Bengal had mostly become dissolute. They had, uh, Rachudri goes on to say that they had actually, uh, they were bequeathed, the, the, the gift of partition of a free country was bequeathed to this generation uh, without any effort on their part. So, they had, uh, uh, they were born or they had got a free nation without having to do anything for it basically. So, it was an entirely dissipate and corrupt uh, generation. Uh, and they were also badly influenced by the, the famine, the impact of famine and uh, second world war persisted. And so, the, the lofty ideas and old values were being misutilized for acquisition of power and also for vote catching. So, a new social laws actually justified getting hold of money uh, in, in questionable ways uh, without commanding any respect. And uh, so, a, a, a person that was uh, suddenly a newly rich person without any cultural capital uh, or who had uh, acquired money in a, a, through questionable means was not looked down upon. Uh, but in fact, such uh, people would have all the excesses, I mean such people would have access to all social privileges in a society. So, uh, Bengal. Uh, also witnessed uh, change in the definition of gundas or antisocial uh, thugs and so these uh, antisocials would have alliance with the rich uh, that made them socially acceptable and even respectable and influential they offered protection of lives uh, to to uh, i mean and, and they offered protection of lives and uh, instead of uh, being boycotted as 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 uh, um, instead of being socially boycotted, they uh, started uh, determining the course of socio-political developments in West Bengal. Similarly, the Mastans uh, were the offshoots of the Bhadralok educated middle class families that were actually suffering from unemployment. So, uh, the lack of job availability pushed youths into crime, hooliganism and 
corruption. Now, W. W. Hunter notes that there are two kinds of Muslims in India, uh, the foreign born aristocratic Ashraf and the lower caste Hindu converts Atrap. The Atraps majorly constitute the Muslims in the subcontinent. Uh, so, 19th century Bengal's revivalist reformist movements such as Farazi and Tarikai Muhammadiyah uh, are explicit attempts at purifying Islam through socio-political programs and uh, by drawing the supports of the grassroots and the marginalized. Rafi, uh, Rafiuddin Ahmed notes how the nature of these reforms uh, propaganda actually uh, alienated the moneyed class people such as the merchants, the moneylenders and the urban educated Muslims. So, uh, in the last quarter of 19th century, one sees militant impulses being replaced by more moderate forms of reform from within uh, among the Bengali Muslims. So, uh, Muslims were uh, I mean getting educated, they aimed at revival of the ancient glory of Islam uh, with uh, and, and wanted to amalgamate this glory with uh, or this ancient glory with modern spirit and cooperation with the West. So, census report 1872 uh, says that majority of Muslims were from Bengal of Indian origin that were um, uh, I mean educated urban Muslims did not wish to be associated with the stereotype created either by the British or by the Hindus. So, the B British would actually uh, see them as uh, Indian and uh, the Hindus would assert that they are low class low caste Muslim converts. So, uh, they reinvented the Muslim middle class actually educated reformist class uh, uh, or group actually uh, reinvented themselves as foreign born Ashrafs. This was an attitude uh, especially among the lower middle class Muslims that wanted to escape the taboo of inauthentic identity. And by 1901, we see if, if we look at the census of 1901, there was an increase in the number of sheikhs, Sayyids, uh, Sayyids and uh, Mughals as well as Pathans and there was a corresponding decrease in the ranks of occupational caste groups. This is actually getting back at the derogatory, uh, derogatory representation of uh, Muslims both by the British and the Hindus in 19th and 20th century uh, Bengali writings that uh, depict the, them as uh, foreign invaders, ex-Hindu converts, traitors, abductors and so on. So, uh, we also look at the Muslim women's uh, private stories um, uh, where they criticize the Muslim male's privilege and challenge the dominant histories through oral accounts. There is uh, writing by Jahanara where uh, she uh, talks about how uh, people ask her if she is Bengali because of her name. She is brought up in uh, Bengali ambience, her parents were nationalist Muslims and she went to a Brahmo school in uh, North Calcutta namely Victoria institution. So, uh, unlike the Ashraf class Muslims who would alienate from Bengali nationalist movement that was spearheaded by the Hindu middle and upper middle class uh, people uh, in, in uh, early 20th century, uh, Bengali identity became very important for, for the Bengali Muslims as a way of appropriating a nationalist uh, Muslim fam familial belongingness. So, Jehanara's uh, Persian name at the same time, so she, she has both the belonging, she wants to claim her national Muslim. Uh, a nationalist Muslim, uh, uh, you know, sense of identity and yet situate herself through her Persian name, situate herself firmly to the moral and cultural universe of Islam. So, Jainara establishes her family's upper cl class, uh, upper middle class status and talks about uh, an amiable father, uh, uh, an amiable Muslim father which in fact uh, challenges the representation of Muslims as, as uh, treacherous or, or violent uh, and, and it displaces the destructive agency of Muslims who were outside seen as outside from Bengal. So, uh, another uh, Muslim female writer is Zohra, uh, is Zohra Sultana who was brought up under broad outlook of international community. She actually uh, asserts a cosmopolitan, uh, cosmopolitan casting of herself and her family and her happenstance with Islam is a dialogic response towards uh, the pejoratic, uh, uh, towards the pejorative uh, stock image of the Muslims uh, etched by the re reactionary Hindus in 1990s India. So, uh, this desire to be the Muslim and yet a Bengali creates a tension. So, for instance, uh, Mehrunisa points out how uh, 
despite her being originally from uh, Ahmedabad, she adapted to uh, Bengaliness. Uh, her and and she talks about her maternal grandfather who was converted to Islam. And so, being uh, being Bengali on the one hand, and yet uh, uh, ascribing to or subscribing to the loyalty, integrity, and courage of being a Muslim man uh, was something that uh, they wanted to uh, actually assert. Uh, growing up, the growing up generation among the middle class Muslims remember preoccupation with Bengal, uh, Bengali cult, language, and identity. And the wealthy uh, Muslim families, however, spoke Urdu at home. So there was, uh, I mean, this uh, uh, rift that uh, the, the Bengali Muslims were looking to uh, negotiate with. Uh, Mehrun Nisa openly criticizes Muslim men for their conservative uh, attitude, lack of understanding for changing times and uh, she belongs to an affluent family of Muslim businessmen in Calcutta speaks uh, in English as well as in Bengali but with uh, an accent of uh, Urdu and so she condemns the easy life of, of the Muslims and uh, uh, she talks about how the Muslims saw government scholarships as chariots or charity in which they would not participate. Comparatively, Hindu middle class people stayed as implicit referent uh, to through, I mean she refers to the Hindu middle classes, uh, Hindu middle, uh, middle class people that uh, you know took advantage of this scholarship. So, th th the Hindu middle class remain uh, a referent throughout uh, her narrative. She adopts a voice of imagined Hindu middle class when she uh, describes what ought to be proper parental uh, attitude to children's education. And uh, she actually talks about, uh, she, she refers to how uh, the, the Muslim men saw themselves as descendants of Mughal kings uh, and so their attitude uh, was I mean looking down upon uh, the idea of uh, chakri or nokri uh, under the Britishers, uh, rather they would live lavish lives of uh, out of uh, you know uh, big businesses uh, without holding any educational degree. So, uh, one sees that uh, while Mehru Nisa is uh, uh, celebrating Hindu uh, women uh, for their thriftiness, she is probably also celebrating the idea of uh, Muslims aristocracy uh, and, and uh, in a way pointing out at uh, Hindus uh, you know selfishness. So, so in through her criticism she is maybe also uh, bringing out a different kind of uh, you know royal background uh, and, and mourning for that the loss of that background uh, for, for the uh, aristocratic Muslims. So, uh, mo another uh, work by mo Mumtaz Wahida points out to the immense wealth and ar aristocracy of both her parents uh, where her, her relatives held high posts both in Calcutta and in uh, Bangladesh. So, uh, Jahanira's uh, assertion of Bengaliness was through tracing high caste Hindu ancestry for her family and when uh, Jehanera says that Muslims in Bengal were converts, um, she suggests that any number of Bengali Muslim families can lay claim to a high caste origin. So, so this is a way of uh, constructing uh, one's sense of uh, self through pedigree or uh, through uh, delineating one's family uh, family tree. So. Uh, so, one sees, Sufiya Kamal uh, says that one crucial source of bitterness between the two communities was access to job, jobs with the British administration was created, uh, that created uh, an important division between Bhadralok and Chotolok uh, was there. So, Muslims were essentially seen as non-Bhadralok according to uh, popular Hindu uh, perception and so stock images uh, of Muslims were with caps, skull caps and lungis and women were with uh, uh, I mean seen as burkha clad uh, and they were opposed to, uh, they were seemingly opposed to everything that aligned with reason and progress. So, uh, I would just uh, like to uh, point out to how Jehanera faced the burden of being acceptable based on uh, Hindu designed parameters. She would, uh, I mean Hindu women friends of Jehanera were conscious uh, in expressing their depth of friendship with her and, and, in, um, and, and they said that they were proud of being close to a liberal Muslim such as uh, Jehanera. So, she uh, was able to 
uh, be uh, she was able to uh, earn this acceptance through distancing herself from the telltale signs of Muslimness. And she narrates about her abrupt departure uh, for Azan one day, uh, which uh, something that she had never done before. And and this. Uh, act actually asserts her Muslimness, which she had downplayed up to a point. And uh, so, this act also um, makes her uh, a kind of, uh, you know, it, it, it is it's a, this act is a disruption uh, to her, uh, you know, uh, belonging among the liberal Hindu friends. Uh, and so, it is actually an assertion of her uh, Muslim femaleness. Uh, with this, I am going to stop today's discussion and I will meet you again for another round of discussions in another lecture. Thank you.